So during our last lecture, we talked about homeostatic feedback systems, uh, homeostatic control systems. We talked about the, the stereotypical control system that involved um, our controlled variable, whatever that may be, that is some parameter of usually extracellular fluid or some other, um, or some other controlled variable um, that is being either held at a set point or at a healthy range. Uh, we have a sensor that monitors that controlled variable. We have an integrator or control center that um, is constantly reading the information coming in from the sensor and comparing it to our set point. And if need be, the control center can stimulate an effector in order to bring about a compensatory response that brings the controlled variable back to set point in the, in the case of a deviation. And then we have this negative feedback regulation that allows the system to shut itself off. And the example that we talked about in class was the, the thermostat, um, the room temperature and thermostat example. We talked about the room temperature being set to 72, but it drops to 60. The thermostat reads that from the thermometer. It turns on the furnace. It, that increases heat uh, output, and that brings the room temperature back to 72, and that shuts the whole system off. So this simple... Um, homeostatic control system, we also talked about how um, re more realistic control systems are much more complicated because they require some degree of prediction in order to overcome the natural time lags um, that are involved in receiving sensation um, and uh, putting into effect some sort of uh, compensatory response. Uh, so prediction helps us overcome the time lags involved in a, in a feedback loop in order to make sure that we actually maintain the set point rather than constantly um, overshoot or undershoot. And the example I showed um, for a more realistic homeostatic feedback system uh, is, was the one about te um, real temperature regulation by the body and that the thermostat really actually resides within the brain at the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus actually monitors, monitors both core temperature, right, the, the temperature of the, um, the core part of our body, uh, and it also monitors skin temperature. And so the goal of the system is to actually maintain a healthy core temperature. But the skin temperature, which actually is fluctuating in order to reflect um, changes in, in temperature of the ambient environment, this skin temperature is actually used by the hypothalamus as a way to predict um, the direction that core temperature may go in. Um, and so using skin temperature as a prediction, the, um, our thermostat can actually um, anticipate the needs in terms of either conserving heat in the core or letting out heat from the core in order to maintain this core temperature um, at a constant level. So that's an example of a more realistic, or that was our example of a more realistic um, homeostatic feedback mechanism. So <clears throat> in maintaining homeostasis in the body, um, we actually have two body systems that are our major control systems. Um, we have the nervous system and the endocrine system. These organ systems are responsible for controlling, regulating, um, and maintaining homeostasis throughout the body. Okay. So all of our other organ systems, the digestive system, the cardiovascular system, the renal system, all of these other systems are controlled and regulated by um, our nervous system and by our endocrine system. Okay. So we're going to study these two global control systems um, sequentially. We're going to talk about the nervous system first and then we're going to talk about the endocrine system. That's the next section. Um, so if we look at this table, what we're looking at is actually just a little side-by-side -side comparison between um, some characteristics or properties of the nervous system 
and characteristics and properties of the endocrine system. So the nervous system is really, in terms of anatomical arrangement, a hardwired system. Okay? So elements within the nervous system are physically um, connected to one another. So information transfer is a physical transfer. And that's very different from the endocrine system, which is really a wireless system. It, it's composed of endocrine glands that are scattered throughout the body that release hormones into the bloodstream. And these hormones can then um, disperse themselves throughout the body and then find target cells and, and create responses in the target cells. Both systems use chemical messengers. In the nervous system, the chemical messengers that are uh, released we call neurotransmitters, um, and they're usually released into an air, um, a space called the synaptic cleft, which then acts on the, the very next cell. So usually neurotransmitters um, don't need to travel very far because they're just going to the very next cell. In the endocrine system, the chemical messengers are hormones, uh, and they actually are getting into the bloodstream, and they are they are traveling very very long distances, and and um, are able to actually act on multiple targets throughout the body. Wherever the blood goes, the hormone goes. Um, the speed of response, if we sort of skip forward a little bit, the speed of response. The nervous system is a very very um, it can bring about very, very rapid changes. Um, so the nervous system brings about a very rapid response, uh, as opposed to the endocrine system where the response can be a little bit more delayed, okay? Because the, the hormone actually has to enter the bloodstream, the concentration has to build, and then it acts on cells. Um, <clears throat> however, the duration of action, right, so how long the response is, in the nervous system, usually it's a brief response. So it's a very rapid response, but it's very brief and short-lived. In the endocrine system, it's a more delayed response. It takes a little more time to turn on, but then it's a much more sustained response. So the endocrine system creates um, responses that are much, much longer in duration. Okay. Um, so there's some other key differences between these systems that will become more clear as we go through. Uh, but these are some of the, the basic properties. So the first system we're going to talk about is actually the, the nervous system. And so just talking uh, in general about the structure of the nervous system, the nervous system in our body is divided into several branches. The, the two major branches um, include the central nervous system, which is uh, which includes the brain and the spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system, which is the network of nerves that that extend out from the brain and the spinal cord. Okay. So included in the peripheral nervous system are two branches. Okay. So the so the nerves that are branching out into the body from the brain and the spinal cord have really two major divisions. We have the afferent division, which is really our sensory division. It's, it's the part of our peripheral nervous system that carries information about the body toward the central nervous system. Okay, so it's our sensory arm, the afferent division. And then we have the efferent division, and that carries out commands from our central nervous system out towards our body. Okay. So among the efferent, if we look at the efferent division first, we have two types of commands that go out towards our body. We have efferent uh, commands that go towards what are, what's called the somatic nervous system, which is basically... Um, our motor neurons that then innervate or stimulate our skeletal muscle. Okay. So this is this division, the somatic division that uh, involves motor neurons stimulating skeletal muscle, this is our voluntary conscious um, command movements. So these are these are commands that we initiate and that we're very aware of. The other arm of the efferent division is a division that we're not aware of. So this is the autonomic nervous system. This is the part of our um, efferent nervous system that 
controls basically um, visceral function or the function of of our internal organs um, and our uh, which includes smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and all of our gland tissue. And the autonomic nervous system uh, includes two divisions. Our sympathetic nervous system, which carries out our fight or flight responses, which are really our stress responses. And then the parasympathetic nervous system, which brings about um, our rest and digest functions. So the parasympathetic nervous system is usually dominant most of the time. And then under stressful situations, we trigger sympathetic responses. Okay. So again, the targets of the autonomic nervous system include smooth muscle. So smooth muscle that lines the blood vessels, that lines the bladder, um, and various other um, organs and viscera cardiac muscle, the muscle in the heart, and then all gland tissue. And that includes endocrine glands um, and, and exocrine glands. <clears throat> if we go over to the afferent division, that sensory division, we have again, we have two types of sensation that's coming into the brain and spinal cord. We have... Um, what is listed here as sensory stimuli, which is really more accurately described as somatosensory stimuli. Okay. This is the kind of stimulation that we actually are very aware of. This is um, sensory information, somatosensory information that's coming from um, our body and uh, it includes things like sensation of touch, sensation of heat, sensation of pain. Okay, these are all the, the sensory stimuli that we are really very aware of. Okay, and so that's coming in through that afferent division into the spinal cord in the brain. The other type of stimulation coming in is not something we're aware of generally. Then this is visceral stimulation. Okay. And these are things that actually reflect the status of visceral function. So the included in visceral stimulation um, are, are things like blood pressure, things like um, uh, blood volume, blood osmolarity, okay? And this type of of stimulation or this type of sensory information coming into the body, excuse me, into the brain and spinal cord is actually an arm, a sensory arm of this autonomic nervous system that we talked about over here. So you see this arrow, this very sort of con, uh, elaborate arrow, right, that is leading from the targets of the autonomic nervous system, right? Smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, the gland tissue. There is actually a sensory arm that feeds into, feeds back into the central nervous system that tells the central nervous system about the status of these uh, visceral targets. Okay, so you get that um, sort of basic feedback loop uh, involved in all of these autonomic uh, reflexes. So it's the basic uh, physical structure of um, our body's nervous system, central and peripheral nervous system. So it's really um, hard to talk about the nervous system <coughs> and the structure of, of neuronal cells and nerves without mentioning uh, very briefly um, uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Um, and so this, this man was a, um, a neuroscientist in the late 1800s from Spain. He was also a, a histologist, a pathologist, and he really pioneered a type of um, cellular staining called the Golgi staining. And what was so special about the Golgi staining was that it was specific to neuronal cells. It only stained neuronal cells. It stained those cells in great detail. And it also stained the cells um, sporadically. It didn't stain every neuronal cell in a particular um, slide. So as a result, 
he ended up with these extremely elaborate um, uh, staining of cells that he then recreated using his um, expert drawing techniques. And so he created um, many, many of these very, very detailed drawings of neuronal cells. Um, and we take it for granted today, but really until Cajal came around, we did not understand that the nervous system was made up of distinct cells. There was this belief that the nervous system was just this, um, this uh, a singular network of um, of uh, stuff. <laughs> Words are, are failing me. But the singular network that was connected and was not made up of distinct cells. So he made it very clear that um, the nervous system was made up of distinct cells and he very elaborately um, demonstrated the structure of those cells and really created some very beautiful drawings. So, thanks to Cajal, we understand uh, he was the, he pioneered it and then later many people followed to very, in a very detailed way understand the structure um, and function of neuronal cells in our body. So neuronal cells are part of nervous tissue. And, and these cells are one of only two types of cells, um, along with uh, muscle cells. These cells are what we call excitable cells. Now, excitable cells means that they are cells that are capable of firing action potentials. And in chapter two of, of this series, we'll talk about um, the nature of, of action potentials. But basically, action potentials are um, very explosive, um, is the very explosive movement of charged ions across the plasma membrane. Um, and these, and this movement of charged ions creates these electrical impulses. And these electrical impulses then travel through a neuronal cell and actually create um, units of information flow. And it's how these neuronal cells can um, send messages, whether it's sensory me messages from the brain to the body, or, I'm sorry, uh, sensory messages from the body to the brain, or command messages from the brain to the body. Okay. So the basic structure of a neuronal cell includes um, a bulbous central cell body and it's within the cell body that the um, the nucleus of the cell resides and the vast majority of the um, organelles and intracellular um, structure resides. Okay. Extending out from the cell body is the dendritic tree. So these um, structures that are drawn here that really look like branches right of a tree and they are the the cells dendrites and together we call them the dendritic tree now it's through the dendrites that other cells uh, provide input to this particular neuronal cell and you can see that there's connections onto the dendrites of the cell from other cells Okay. So stimulation or information comes into a neuronal cell through its dendrites. Okay. Now, stimulation or information is, um, is, what I mean by stimulation or information is basically um, with these electrical impulses, right, these action potentials. So if enough stimulation comes in through the dendritic tree onto the cell, this cell will fire an action potential, that electrical impulse. That action potential will start here at what's called the axon HELOC. Okay? And it will travel down this long structure of the neuron called the axon. Okay? And it will end Right, that electrical impulse will travel all the way to what's called the um, axon terminal. Okay. 
which are the end points of this axon. And as you can see here in this, in this picture, those axon terminals are synapsing or connecting to the dendrites of another neuronal cell. Okay, So this is a little depiction of cell-to-cell of -cell communication right, from one neuronal cell to the next. And you can see this one neuronal cell is receiving many, many inputs from many, many cells, and it is providing input into or onto um, many, many other cells. Okay. So this is the basic structure of neurons and uh, neuronal connections. <clears throat> Most neurons in the body um, have axons that are what we called, call myelinated. And myelination is essentially insulation of this axon. So very similarly to the wire, electrical wires that are in your home, um, those wires are not exposed, right? They have, are actually covered by, um, by plastic covering in order to insulate the flow of electricity through those wires. So myelination is, is similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar. Um, when we myelinate an axon, what we're actually doing is actually speeding up the rate at which the, the um, electrical impulse travels down the axon. And that's the most important thing we're doing. We are speeding up the rate of movement of this, uh, or traveling, uh, excuse me, speeding up the rate um, at which this electrical impulse travels down this axon. And that's the most important thing we're doing with myelination. Um, but what we're also doing is um, increasing the likelihood that this signal is not lost from one end of the axon to the next. So it's preservation of signal and um, enhancement of the velocity of flow. So in the peripheral nervous system, so this, is, this picture is of a very typical uh, peripheral nerve. Um, the myelination is in the form of what we call Schwann cells. And you can see this, the Schwann cells, um, those purple circles, are, um, or ovals rather, are the nuclei of the cell. Schwann cells are these um, cells that are sort of flattened. They're very flat, and they wrap around the axon of this peripheral nerve. And so here in this, in this slide, we show one, two, three, four, five um, Schwann cells wrapped around this axon. And what's not entirely clear in this picture, um, but, but what does exist, is that there is a small space um, where the axon is just a tiny bit exposed in between these Schwann cells. And that small bit of exposed axon in between the Schwann cells are called nodes of Ranvier. And the nodes of Ranvier are areas where action potentials are occurring, okay, or those electrical impulses are occurring. So when an, an electrical impulse or an action potential travels down an axon that's myelinated, it doesn't actually have to fire at every um, at, at, all, at the entire area or length of axon. It actually travels from one node to the next node to the next node. Okay? And so by, by jumping from one node to the next, that's how we speed up the velocity of flow of an action potential down an axon. Okay. So myelination, as I said, in the peripheral nervous system is done through the, the Schwann cells, okay, is provided by these Schwann cells, and it greatly speeds up the velocity of information flow. In the central nervous system, we also have myelination, but there's a separate group of cells that actually provide myelination in the central nervous system. So this is brain and spinal cord. Um, and those cells are called oligodendrocytes. And an oligodendrocyte 
Um, it's actually a type of uh, class of cell in the central nervous system that we call glial cells. These are just supportive cells. Um, and so an oligodendrocyte uh, drawn here, we've got the cell body of the cell um, and the nucleus. It sends out these foot-like projections that wrap around axons uh, that surround the cell and it provides myelination. And in this slide you can actually see much more clearly the nodes of um, exposed axon in between these areas of myelination. Okay, that wasn't so clear when we looked at the last slide with the Schwann cells. Okay. So myelination in the peripheral nervous system is provided by Schwann cells. Myelination in the central nervous system is provided by oligodendrocytes. Okay. So in addition to neuronal cells having that basic physical structure of a dendritic tree, a cell body, an axon, axon terminals leading to the next cell. Okay, that's the basic structure. Um, it's also important to talk about three basic types of neurons. Okay, three very basic types of neurons. We have efferent neurons. Okay, these are command neurons. These are neuronal cells. Their cell bodies are um, located within the central nervous system. Okay. The electrical impulse, action potential, command signal originates in the central nervous system and then moves toward the peripheral nervous system and eventually toward some sort of target cell. Okay. So an efferent neuron, cell body lives in the central nervous system. The, it extends out into the peripheral nervous system and, and has some sort of um, target onto uh, an effector organ or a target cell. Okay. On the other hand, we have afferent neurons. And these afferent neurons are really sensory neurons. And the structure of afferent neurons are um, a little bit different in general uh, compared to other um, neurons that we've looked at. Okay, so a typical afferent neuron, especially one that, that um, provides somatosensation, sensation that we are consciously aware of, these kinds of afferent neurons have a very particular kind of appearance. So these neurons <clears throat> usually have some sort of specialized receptor uh, that lives within the organ that that it's providing sensation. So this drawing, this specialized receptor looks a little bit like a Meissner's corpuscle. That's a pressure receptor that uh, you can find in the in the skin. Okay, so it this particular receptor is designed to transfer whatever it's supposed to be sensing. In this case, pressure on the skin, and it converts that signal into an electrical impulse or into an action potential. And that is the, the purpose of this particular receptor. And then that electrical impulse travels toward, within the peripheral, peripheral nervous system, toward the central nervous system. The cell body of this sensory neuron is, is much closer to the um, spinal cord or the central nervous system than the receptor. Okay, so the cell body is, um, is located close to the spinal cord. The electrical impulse then travels into the spinal cord um, and ends at these axon terminals. Okay. So for the afferent neuron, we've got a specialized receptor at the surface of the skin in this example. The cell body resides within the peripheral nervous system, but close to the boundary of the central nervous system. And the axon terminal can actually be found um, it, within the central nervous system. Okay. And then the third class of neurons that we see in, our, in the nervous system of our body 
are called interneurons. Okay? And interneurons are neuronal cells that connect afferent neurons to efferent neurons. Okay? Interneurons, and these are this is a huge, very diverse class of neurons, they provide a processing of this sensory signal, right? This afferent signal. It processes the, this afferent signal and actually creates an efferent command. Okay. So the so a single afferent neuron can actually terminate onto multiple interneurons okay, that create or convey the signal and bring about some sort of efferent response. But interneurons are located entirely within the central nervous system. So this um, classification of three different types of neurons, afferent, efferent, interneuron, we'll explore this in, in much greater detail when we look at um, uh, neuronal circuits, which, which is um, something we do quite a lot within the, when, we, when we study the structure and function of the peripheral nervous system okay, and the central nervous system. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs>